specialty is constitutional law. He's taught constitutional law. He's written a book on that. He's also a published author on other books, which are um, The Mortarman. It's a book about his father's unit in World War II, Riders in the Sky, The Ghosts and Legends of Philmont Scout Ranch. Uh, he's written two other no uh, a novel and a America's Liveliest Ghost Books. So he really is an expert on constitutional law. His books in that, by the way, are available for purchase over at the table over there after today if you want to talk to him and that sort of thing. Anyhow, I'd like to have Michael Connolly coming up and for a very good presentation on the law and to scare us a little bit about what's going to, what's happening under Obama. Constitution. It's not in the First Amendment like they thought it was. It's not anywhere in the Constitution. Yet it's being used to stifle freedom of religion. On my blog, I wrote an article not long ago that said, said simply, it's not freedom from religion, it's freedom of religion. That's what it's all about. Now we have a President of the United States who is bent on tearing this Constitution up. He's being aided and abetted by judges, by members of Congress. As far as I'm concerned, and again, I, on my blog, I've written two articles on impeachable offenses that I think Obama's committed. The main thing he's done is violate his oath of office. He does it, Harry Reid does it, Nancy Pelosi does it, the bureaucrats in Washington do it on a daily basis. So what is that oath? Very similar. I saw a lot of veterans here. Or I see a lot of veterans here, here but we were all standing saluting during the Pledge of the Allegiance. The, we took an oath to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Obama took an oath to support and defend and preserve the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. There is, in fact, a federal statute that provides criminal and civil penalties for failing to follow that oath of office. If you do something detrimental to the Constitution, which he does on a daily basis, then you can be sent to prison for a year and fined up to $10,000. <clears throat> Obama is the President of the United States. Article 2, Section 2 of the Constitution says, establishes that office and basically tells you what it means. It gives him the authority, in fact, it's not just the authority, he is mandated by Article 2, Section 2 of the Constitution to enforce the laws, enforce the laws that have been passed by Congress. See, whatever happened to the balance of powers? Three branches of government, legislative, the Congress, executive branch, the president, judiciary, the courts. They're supposed to be balancing each other out. And Obama's told he has to enforce the laws passed by Congress. It doesn't say you can pick what you want us to enforce. It doesn't say it's your choice. But he's refusing to enforce immigration laws He's refusing to enforce the, or defend the uh, Marriage Act, Defense of Marriage Act. 
Certainly, Article II, Section 2 doesn't give him the authority to make laws. He does that on a daily basis. The executive orders he's signing are horrendous. He signs, he's, well, he told us he was going to do this. Just like before he was elected president, he told us what he was going to do to things like the coal industry. He was going to destroy it. He warned us, and we voted for him anyway, or at least the majority of the American people did. Then he told us that if Congress wouldn't do what he wanted, he and Joe would do it themselves. And they're doing it. He is about to pass, to sign an executive order. And we're not sure whether he's going to do this before the election or after the election. But he's going to do it, whether he's re-elected or not. He's going to sign an executive order giving him control of the content of the internet in this country. That's one of the things I've been talking about on the radio shows recently. Control of the content of the internet. The kill switch. Remember, there were two bills introduced in Congress to try to give him authority to control the internet, the so-called cyber crisis, but he decides what, what the crisis really is. Both of them were withdrawn, because liberals and conservatives both were aghast at the idea that he would have complete control over our First Amendment rights. He said afterwards that he was going to do, to take it anyway. He's going to do it one of two ways, either by signing an executive order or by uh, signing the treaty that's proposed in the United Nations. Now, the treaty is even worse than the executive order. Because besides that treaty, that not only gives him authority to control the internet, but gives a select group of other nations the authority to control the internet in the United States. China, Iran, <laughs> would all have input into our internet, what we can watch. You think this nonsense about this movie causing all these riots in uh, the Mideast is bad. Wait till you hear what the United Nations wants to do. They want to make it a crime in every country in the world, including the United States, to say anything bad about Islam. You can't even, if you are a member of the, of the intelligence community right now, and I was, I'm a former military intelligence officer, I still have <clears throat> my contacts. In fact, we meet about once every six weeks, and we discuss things that we can't really talk about, take out of the room. Let's just say it's scared me to have to death every time, every time I hear. But the intelligence community right now, when they write a report, even a confidential report, they cannot use the words radical Islam. They cannot use the words jihadist. It's politically incorrect. Political correctness is driving our military crazy. This is the type of thing he wants to do. This is the type of thing that will be done if he remains the president. It will be done on a continuous basis. We have Congress in collusion with all this to destroy our, our, our rights. The National Defense Authorization Act, when it was first proposed in Congress, I read the entire thing because I was told the White House had had some language specifically inserted. I read it, and I looked at it and said, this can't be. I started talking about it on my talk radio show. And this language basically authorizes the President of the United States for the first time in history to order the military to arrest and detain anyone in this room simply because the President says you're a potential terrorist. To detain you without trial, without even charges being filed, and do it indefinitely. People listen to my radio show and read my blog were writing their members of Congress, the Republicans and Democrats, saying, do not pass this. They were getting a sort of pretty much standard form letter back that says, that's not what that language really means. It means the threat. It says the military can't do it. Read the language. Members of Congress don't read the bills anymore. They just pass them. The language specifically says that the military doesn't have to do this unless the president orders it to. <clears throat> Am I subject to arrest? I'm probably on every terrorist watch list they have. 
because under the Department of Homeland Security, if you believe in the Second Amendment, you're a potential terrorist. If you're pro-life, you're a potential terrorist. If you have a Ron Paul bumper sticker on your car, you're a potential terrorist. Now I imagine it's a Romney bumper sticker too on your car. <laughs> the latest one, though, and this is the one that really is it's laughable if it wasn't true. The latest one is if you have more than seven days' supply of food and water, you're, you're a potential terrorist. So we have the President of the United States with these executive orders, we have the Congress passing the NDAA. And by the way, a federal judge in Maryland <coughs> ruled a couple of weeks ago that I was in fact right. And she stopped that part of the law from being enforced. She put an injunction against it, which has now been overturned by the appeals court. But she said exactly what I said and what other people were saying. That's what that bill meant. Yet you've got members of Congress, Republicans and Democrats, still denying that that's what it means. Then you have the President of the United States shortly after that issuing an executive order basically saying that if he declares an emergency, a national emergency, and again, he, he decides what that is. He can take, he will take control at that point of all of our food, all water, all transportation, all health care, which basically he's got already. He can take control of all that and all communications. That includes the internet. He signed an executive order giving him that power. Where is Congress? I work with the U.S. Justice Foundation, and I was a retired constitutional lawyer. Now I'm not anymore because I'm coming out of retirement to work with them and file suits in federal court. And uh, <clears throat> why haven't we're going to be doing a lot of stuff on our own? But we need help. Why haven't the members of Congress, particularly the members of the United States Senate, why didn't anybody stand up when Obama started appointing these czars and say, whoa, the Constitution doesn't give you the authority to appoint somebody without it going through the Senate. By appointing these czars, you're taking away my power as a U.S. Senator to represent the people in my state. Why didn't somebody stand up and file a suit, a lawsuit? Because the Constitution is clear. Yet he's appointed 45 czars with their own budgets that can't be touched by Congress. And other than some lip service, oh, that's not nice. Congress is doing nothing. So we have to make a stand. Okay, we have to make a stand in this election. There is, if we win the election, and right now, according to the polls, of course, I don't believe much in the polls, but according to the polls, of uh, the majority of the people in this country are willing to commit national suicide, which is what will happen if Obama is reelected. We will never have another free election if he is reelected. I'm not even sure how free this one's going to be because of the information we're getting about the voter fraud and the way that Eric Holder is fighting against voter ID laws, like here in Texas, and fighting to keep the dead from being purged from voting rolls. <clears throat> well, I mean, after all, a large part of Obama's constituency is, is dead, either physically or mentally or both. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we've got to make a stand. But even if we win, the battle is just starting. We have, over the years, been losing ground on a daily basis. And I worked on Ronald Reagan's staff when he ran for president both times. We thought that was going to be our savior. He did great work. But even during his presidency, we were still losing ground when it comes to our freedoms, losing it to the bureaucracy, losing it to state and local governments who are intent on being politically correct, taking away our freedom of speech, taking away a number of our rights, disarming us, we have to fight at every level. And none of that is going to stop if Obama's not the president. Because your local people are still going to push Agenda 21. 
They're going to push gun control. They're going to push things that we have to fight against. It may not happen in this county, but it will happen in the state of Texas somewhere. It will happen even around the country. So the fight is not going to stop. But we have to win this fight, ultimately. I've got two sons in the military. The oldest boy is a major in the Army, combat engineer, especially is hunting down IEDs and detonating them or defusing them so they can study them. He has spent, <clears throat> he's been on six combat tours so far. Since 9 11, he's been in combat for 72 months total. My youngest is a Black Hawk pilot. I owe it to them and nobody else, because they're out fighting for our freedom every day. I owe it to them to put up a fight here at home. And <clears throat> the oldest boy, <clears throat> He does 72 months in combat without a scratch. Comes home, goes to the Bahamas to do some diving, and gets attacked by a shark. <laughs> His younger brother's been giving him heck about that every day. <laughs> 500 stitches in his leg. He's okay, he's back running, in fact, he's back in training. He's going back overseas again, sometime in October, November. And uh, I'll tell you a little story about it, though. The day I almost killed him. Uh, he was coming back from, he was in Iraq on his third combat tour, he was up in Mosul, northern Iraq. Due home on Saturday, we're back in the States, back to base on Saturday. It's Thursday morning, I get up with my coffee, and I'm half asleep, but I turn on the internet, and here's an email from him, he said, check this out, Dad, it's really neat. I turn it on, there's a video of a, con of a convoy barreling down this highway outside of Mosul in northern Iraq. An armored vehicle, an armored SUV, they're filming from another armored vehicle. All of a sudden, the car on the side of the road explodes, the front of the SUV caves in flames. You hear automatic weapon fire break out. The camera's bouncing around as these guys are bailing out of that SUV. The camera goes black, you still hear the, the gunfire. The camera comes back on in about a minute, and they're filming an American soldier kneeling down in the middle of the highway, firing at the bad guys. They say something to him, he looks up the camera and grins, and he's by something. And I'm yelling like an idiot at the computer screen, some focus. Yeah. You're not in a high school football game where you tie them off. You know, you're a good firefight. <laughs> but they're doing their part. And we have to do our part. And we are losing our freedoms rapidly. I have a video that's on YouTube. Uh, and you can pick up one of my business cards and, and access my blog site. And you can. Uh, Look at the video, you look, access my talk radio show, which is live on, at 3 o'clock on Wednesdays, but it's archived, so you can listen to it. And you can find out about what I'm talking about here. The video is two parts, and basically I tell people exactly what I'm telling you, except in more detail, about how the Constitution is being destroyed. And I tear pages out of it as I talk about it. It's pretty devastating to sit there and do that. And people tell me it's pretty devastating to sit there and watch that. But that's exactly what's happened. That is what's happened. And we've got these booklets for sale for $5 each. And uh, if you want to make a contribution to help us subsidize it, we, last week, six school districts in South Texas distributed 500 of these to their seniors. So we're getting orders from all of the the country for these. And we, we sold them at a reduced price. We actually lost money on them, except some people came in and, and subsidized the sale of them. But people are carrying these around their pockets, and their purses, and pulling them out. Somebody says something, your neighbor says something about the Constitution, like what's in the First Amendment? Uh, what's in there about the uh, separation of church and state? You can pull it out, point it to them. Because there's so, people don't know what's going on. I keep talking to my radio show about the fact that if they don't know what's in the Constitution, how are they going to know when they're losing their rights? They're not. Here's something else that's funny on his face, but also scary. About four years ago, the First Amendment Foundation did a survey of 1,500 new college graduates and asked them, what are the five rights protected under the First Amendment of the Constitution? 
Only about 25% could name all five. Only about 60% could name one. They didn't know about freedom of speech, freedom of press, freedom of religion, the right to peacefully assemble, the right to go and ask our own government for redress of grievances. They didn't know about all this. They didn't know about freedom of religion, or at least they didn't know where it was in the Constitution. However, 25% of the people surveyed thought the First Amendment protected their right to own a pet. <laughs> people need to win. Right to own a pet. Dog or cat, you know, it's unbelievable. The people need to know about this. And I've been, there's some other books for sale, one about my dad Jr. during World War II. Uh, he landed the second wave of Utah Beach and they were in combat 326 straight days. So it runs in my family. And uh, we actually go all the way back to the Revolutionary War. There's a book there called Abby Yaley, The Story of America. Abby Yaley is a Cherokee word. And uh, it basically, I wrote it 25 years ago, shoved it in a drawer, and he tried to get it published. It de dealt with the Russians. Uh, we had a weak president in the book, weak Congress, cut our military, basically destroyed our way of life, and the Russians took advantage of it and attacked us and took our country. Well, I updated it a few years ago and made it Chinese. And in that book, a lot of the things I talked about 25 years ago are happening now. Because we talked about the Chinese building up their military, putting stuff in out, and launching things in space, rockets, aircraft carriers. People are calling me about that book and doing, you know, we can't believe this. This is what's happening. But the main thing it's about is about the American people and how we fight back. The resistance that springs up. I hope it's not going to come to that, but I'm prepared for it. And I'm, as a matter of fact, my fiance and I are going to be going this afternoon after we leave here and putting in a uh, uh, an offer on a ranch here in East Texas. So we may be your neighbors before long. I don't want to be in Dallas when things fall apart. I don't want to be in the city. And we're looking at the possibility of that happening. If Obama is reelected, I can almost guarantee it's going to happen. I read a book years ago called Mein Kampf. That was written by Adolf Hitler while he was in prison. And it detailed how he was going to take control of the German government and what he was going to do. I think Obama keeps a copy of that book by his bedside table because he's following the pattern. What was the first thing that Hitler did when he became chancellor? What was the first area of the economy in that country that he took over? Healthcare. Then he started taking the guns away from individual citizens. Then he started to destroy the basic structure of the military, getting rid of those people who were loyal to their country and not to him. Do you ever hear what Obama, did anybody catch it when he said one day he wanted to thank the, the soldiers and sailors and Marines, the people in the military for fighting for him? What kind of ego is that? I didn't take an oath of office to protect and defend Obama. I took one to protect and defend the Constitution. He's not doing this. So we need to be prepared for any eventuality. But the main thing we need to do is just let people know. We've got six weeks left. We need to let them know. That's why I'm doing all these radio shows. Trying to get to people, get to undecided voters out there, get to people that voted for Obama. There are a lot of them out there that are disgusted with it, but don't really want to vote for it or somebody else. So it's up to us. Now, at this point, I'll take any questions you might have about constitutional law or about anything else. Yes, sir. When they, when they, when the president, of course, what is he up to? A little over 3,000 executive orders now? Uh, no. He got it. But there's a pile of, uh, there must be a pile of, of uh, federal registers out there in Washington. But when he does that, seems that these are pretended laws, I think, because 
if Congress doesn't back up these um, executive orders, then uh, and the only reason why they, they, they go into our society and are treated like laws is because we, the people, are ignorant of the constitutional violations that these things present on a daily basis. If, if we were all more aware of these things, I, I don't think there would be so many of them. And, and uh, I, I, don't, I don't know. This is a, when they do this, in your opinion, uh, these executive orders, they can't be rescinded? Well, they can be rescinded. packed away in the Library of Congress and ignored. They can be rescinded, but the problem we have, one of the biggest, biggest problems, and I'm glad you brought this up, is this is one thing, one reason it's going to be so hard to undo the damage that's been done, is because Congress has been complicit in turning over the power to the amazing amounts of power to the executive branch. When I wrote the first article about the health care bill, I read all 1,100 pages and wrote an article back in August 2009. I said that this was, this was not about health care. This was about a massive transfer of power from the Congress to the executive branch of government. And Congress doesn't have the authority to will that kind of power to begin with. Article 1, Section 8 says what Congress can do. We have a limited form of government under our Constitution, or we used to have. The Congress passed this bill, 2,700 pages, that left 4,100 decisions that it should have made in the hands of the President. 4,100 decisions. Everything from who gets health care to what type of health care you get and what's going to cost. The executive orders are doing the same thing. Because what Obama does is he passes one of these executive orders, he signs one of these executive orders, and then the federal bureaucrats and our departments come in and start implementing that with regulations. Thousands and thousands and thousands of regulations. All of which has to be undone. Congress has the power to do it, but we have to control both houses of Congress. Okay. If we don't, then we're wasting our time. Yes, ma'am. Well, um, let me say this, that there are actually not that many, okay? <coughs> We're looking at, oh, about 140 executive orders. And that email's incorrect. But you can go to the White House website, and it lists all the executive orders, supposedly. Uh, some of them they don't list for a couple of weeks. Like there's one, one executive order I've heard about, and it's being talked about, but it's not on the White House website, because that's the last time I looked. That's the one where Obama says that too many black students are being expelled and suspended from school. And therefore, he's putting a quota system on public schools that once you reach a certain number that have been expelled or suspended, you can't do it to anybody else, any other black student, unless you expel or suspend an equal number of whites, Hispanics, or Orientals. Just pick some out. Just pick them out. You know, yeah, just, just pick them out. They don't have to have done anything. And this, this is, but you no, know, you go to the White House website, look under executive orders, and there's something else. There's actually, three categories. <coughs> executive orders are most important. Yes, sir. If you will Google presidential executive orders, it will pull up an index of those orders you can bring them all. And you can go back to the former presidents. And right. What they had in order for presidential. Right, you can't do that. And see, the, some of your executive orders that he's done are very similar to the ones done by presidents in the past, yeah, like the one on the national emergency. But he makes, you have to read them carefully, because he'll change the wording to give himself more power. And that's the way he's been operating. <coughs> what do we do if Obama does win? Hunger down, get ready to fight at every level in the courts. Uh, we're raising money right now for the U.S. Justice Foundation that I'm working with to do battle in the courts and to carry, take over Congress, the entire Congress in two years, 
Do what we continue to do. Do our best, but prepare for the worst. I'm encouraging the listeners of my radio show to start stockpiling at least six months to supply of food and uh, ammunition, which I think is going to be a new currency if things fall apart. But basically, if Obama gets elected, we have to resist. We resist any way we can. If they come to take your neighbor away because your neighbor believes in the Second Amendment, then you have to prepare, be prepared to stand up and say no. We're going to have to stick together as communities and as a country because I think that they have wanted to really try to shut us down completely, shut down our freedoms. Simple as that. I mean, I've seen what this man has done. I've listened to what he said. I see what's coming. I see the patterns of history. I see the support he's got among the so-called progressives. They do not want us to survive as a free nation. People are talking about they want us to be like the socialist nations in Europe. No, it's worse than that. They're looking to make us more like Venezuela or Cuba or China. So be prepared to fight. It's as simple as that. Why hasn't a move to impeach Obama been made? I always get that question. The problem is twofold. Number one, it requires a majority of the House of Representatives to file articles of impeachment. They have to pass it. You don't have a Google Republican majority, you don't have enough out there who are not scared to be politically incorrect because they think that it might help them win the election because people will say, you're racist. You're doing this just because you're black. Well, they call us racist for everybody. Everything, every time I criticize Obama in my, my blogs, somebody posts the thing that you're just a racist. Even if I don't talk, I don't talk about race in my blogs at all. So you have members of the House who are not willing to do it. But in addition to that, even if the House does, it takes two-thirds of the Senate to convict and actually impeach it. We don't have anywhere close to two-thirds. We don't even have a majority. <coughs> And they have to have a full-scale trial with the Supreme Chief Justice of the Supreme Court presiding. And then they set the votes. They have orders on both sides. So we're wasting our time, in other words, by impeachment. Do they haven't found a uh, spine replacement surgery yet? <laughs> no. <laughs> they haven't. Yes, sir. Since the states created the central government, why don't they, especially Texas, stand up and say, we're not taking it anymore? The Constitution doesn't authorize the federal government to violate the compact agreed to between the states. Well, you're talking about the Tenth Amendment. And the Tenth Amendment has been overlooked for years. I can remember, you know, about, was about 15 years ago, I was arguing a case in, in federal court in Baton Rouge where I practiced law. And I raised a case on a constitutional issue, and I raised the Tenth Amendment as being violated. And the judge and the opposing attorneys looked at me like they had no idea what I was talking about. <laughs> Literally, they, they, you know, the Tenth Amendment, what's, what's the Tenth Amendment? The Tenth Amendment provides that if the powers are not given specifically to the federal government and the Constitution, they are reserved to the states and or the people. It's as simple as that. The Tenth Amendment is now being used greatly. It was a big argument in the uh, health care debate and before the Supreme Court. As I see it, the states are going to be the key, particularly if we lose this election. States are going to have to rise up and say no. No, we're not going to do this to our, we're not going to invoke the health care bill and do this to our citizens. We're not going to allow you to come into our states and arrest people and kick down doors and violate their Second Amendment rights. We're just not going to do it. Texas is already doing some of it. Texas is, for example, saying we're not going to follow the EPA rules on coal, on coal plants. There are more and more states out there that are pre prepared to do that. <laughs> I think you're going to see a massive revolt of the states. <coughs> Can the new president repeal prior executive orders with an executive order of his own? You know what? Nobody knows. Uh, literally, that has never been decided by the Supreme Court because we've never had a president do things like this with executive orders, and nobody's ever felt the need to appeal before. 
I feel that Congress has the constitutional power to do away with them, and I think a, pre a president does. But as far as saying that for sure, until the Supreme Court decides it, I can't take it as a sure. To whom does the Constitution give authority to determine if acts of Congress are or are not constitutional? The Constitution gives authority to the U.S. Supreme Court. In the Constitution, only one court is created by the Constitution. That's the United States Supreme Court. The, Fed, the Congress is given power to create lower courts and to give them their authority. This is something else that Congress could be doing. They could be stripping the authority of the federal courts to decide some of these things, like freedom of religion cases. Congress can do that with a majority vote. That's another reason that they can take jurisdiction away from the Supreme Court. That's another reason we need to win this election. This is a question and a comment. Do you know why Obama submitted to Islam at the UN? The future does not belong to those who blaspheme, blaspheme the Prophet Muhammad. That was not clear to the average American, but you can bet Muslims understood him. I have no idea what religion Obama is. I'm not even sure he has a religion. I think he worships himself more than anything else. Yeah. <laughs> But he does, he has in the past, seemed to submit himself and our country to the Muslims. He bowed to a Muslim king. He has apologized for the people of the United States. And this business about you can't talk about radical Islam, that's all for you from the White House. So I can't say that he's a, a Muslim for sure, but he certainly is pro-Muslim. What do you think Obama intended when he said during the first election, we need a civilian force just as large and well-funded as the military? Well, that's in a private army, and the health care bill provides a framework for that. That's hidden in the health care bill. Uh, it allows him to appoint a number of officers and non-commissioned officers to what amounts to a private army. And, you know, again, people heard that and they laughed it off. But why, for example, does the Social Security Administration need 24,000 rounds of hollow point ammunition, which they ordered recently? Why does the Department of Homeland Security need 750 million rounds of high-powered rifle ammunition? What are they getting ready for? These are mostly civilians. Brown shirts. Brown shirts, exactly. That's, that's the mentality. I mean, he's already getting brown shirts. And see, this is one of the things I'm worried about. This is a scenario I don't like this election. We win, Romney wins, the Occupy Wall Streeters, the SEIU thugs, the brown shirts are turned loose on the cities of this country. Burning, looting, rioting, Obama reluctantly declares martial law and says that under the circumstances, he is, can't see letting his successor, elected successor, take over until the, the rioting stops. I hope that won't happen. But right now, I, I'm ready for anything. I'm ready for anything to happen. Uh, two questions. Has Obama started putting the civilian army together, kind of like Hitler's brown shirts, and where does Obama stand on martial law? Well, I think I just answered pretty much that question. I think he is putting his, his private army together. As far as martial law goes, he believes that he can declare martial law for any reason whatsoever, and he's, he's given himself that power, and he is prepared to do that in order to stay in power. I mean, this is not a man who looks like he's afraid he's going to lose this election. He doesn't seem, you know, he doesn't seem worried at all. And we've got the news meeting in his pocket. But, uh, you know, he believes martial law is something that he can do and that he can take complete control of the, the people of this country. Martial law was not designed to do that. Martial law basically deals with the right of habeas corpus. 
It doesn't allow somebody to take complete control of everything in this country, to disarm our people. And by the way, you heard about the UN Small Arms Treaty. That, that's not it. Obama's and other Clinton are still pushing for that, to disarm the American people. And he is ignoring the fact that it has to be ratified by the Senate. He's talking about doing it by executive action. There's no such thing in the Constitution. But he thinks he can do that, and he wants to uh, adopt a small arms treaty. He wants to disarm the American people, despite the fact that the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in 1957 that no treaty, even signed, if signed by the President or ratified by the Senate, can supersede the Constitution of the United States. They can't take away our rights. What tax does the penalty for the mandate in the H.C. bill fall under? Okay, when the health care bill, when the Supreme Court said that uh, they, the Congress has the power to tax, that's what they call them, the penalty, but they have never told us what tax that falls under as the 16th Amendment only lets a direct tax be on income. Okay, well, and we're actually going to get involved in a lawsuit over that situation okay. because of the fact that when this first came out, the first part of the bill, the first 1,100 pages, and that was tough to read. I, I could see a couple of scotches that night trying to get through. <laughs> <laughs> 1,100 pages, when it when first came out, kind of man. <laughs> it called it a tax. Well, then people were crying out against this thing, and they didn't like it. So they changed the word in the Senate bill, and they started calling it a fine or a penalty. I said all along it was not a tax. It was, in fact, a fine. And by trying to call it a tax, what they wanted to do is they wanted to be able to impose it on people, including criminal penalties, for failure to make, make the payments without due process of law, of, of law, violate the Fifth Amendment of the Constitution. Well, then they got the bill, when the bill finally was passed, it was a tax again. Call it what really called a tax. It was called a penalty. And the Supreme Court, in the, the convoluted decision, I don't know where Roberts' head was, but the Supreme Court calls it a tax. Now, here's the problem that they set up. The Constitution specifically says that any tax must, a bill for taxes, must originate in the House of Representatives. The final bill that was passed, the health care bill, originated in the Senate. So if this thing is a tax, it is unconstitutional, the whole bill. Gracias.